Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be joined by Bronwyn Alley. She's a local food systems and small farms educator down in southern Illinois, uh, in the Simpson area, I think, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out where she is here in just a second. Um, mm-hmm. Before we get to Bronwyn, we must introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by mm-hmm. local food systems, small farms educator, Katie Parker in Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Oh, can't you tell? I can barely move still. Uh, I, am, I had two Thanksgivings. Those, you know, one is enough, but then when you have to have two with the other you know, set of like the other side of the family and everything. It's just like, oh, that's that's enough for me. So how was your Thanksgiving? It was good. Uh, it was enjoyable. I think we all cooked our turkeys differently. We mm-hmm. Matt smoked a turkey uh, and he injected a bunch of stuff in it. And then what did you do to yours again? Uh, if this is safe to say on the podcast, I spatchcocked the turkey and then I... Um, <laughs> did a dry um, brine. Basically, you just rub salt all over the thing. And then I took two sticks of butter and just under the skin, on the skin, threw a bunch of herbs and things in it too. Uh, it, it turned out delicious. Yes, it was very good. And the smoked turkey was, um, does it have that smoky flavor that you get from like the carnal, uh, where, where like, you know, carnivals or whatever, when you get turkey legs? I didn't really think so. I don't know. I'm not a big turkey eater, so I didn't get much, but he soaked it in a brine overnight and then he put like a dry rub on it. And then one of his friends gave him like something to inject in it while he was cooking it. So he like injected it every couple hours, I think. So it was super moist. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I don't know. I still didn't care for it that much, but I don't tell him (laughs) that. It's just, just this gamey bird, you know, he's like, oh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, someone who I know probably had like a whole medical IV thing set up to his bird as he was uh, cooking it, uh, horticulture educator Ken Johnson. Ken, how'd the turkey turn out? Turkey was good. We fried it so there was no IV needed. Uh, I didn't burn anything down or start anything on fire, so it's all good. Just another Thanksgiving in the books. Didn't have to call the fire department. Exactly. (laughs) Well, we have our winter webinar series coming up. And so just want to remind folks, if you are interested in that, uh, by the time you hear this, our first one will have already kicked off, but uh, we will post recordings to those uh, here in the future. Uh, But we do have uh, a whole session on tree nuts that's coming up next week. That's, well, well, what's the date? Help me out. Wednesday. Eighth. December December 8th. 8th. That's right. And then following that on December 14th, 15th, 15th, I can't count. Um, math is not my strong suit, um, is we're going to be talking about uh, creating winter interest in our gardens. And then finally on January 12th, yes, okay, uh, we'll just go with that. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about wildlife damage in the landscape and what we can do maybe to prevent that. So folks, we'll leave those links below in the description, but I am super excited to have our guest with us today, uh, Ken and Katie. So we are joined by uh, Bronwyn Alley. Bronwyn, welcome to the show. Thank you guys. This is uh, my first time on a podcast and I feel um, like you guys are going to be great hosts and walk me through this really, really easily. Um, I'm glad to, to uh, hear everybody had a good Thanksgiving. I, uh, I also was in charge of a turkey, and um, I tend to kind of be a fly by the seat of my pants type of person. I'm not good at uh, planning, and so I almost forgot to take the turkey out of the freezer in time. <laughs> um, but I did do a, I did do the uh, overnight brining um, and put it in the roaster, and it was had a good turkey. So I, I was um, just going to ask, delicious. was it still frozen? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it was frozen. It was great. No. <laughs> A good turkey. Well, I, thank you guys for asking me to be on the podcast. Um, well, we are happy to have you here. And Bronwyn, it looks like you are doing your your best levitation impersonation right there. Yeah. And uh, yes. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I love that background. It looks it, it looks delicious. 
Um, lots of greens, it appears, uh, right there. Is that a current photo? Is that, that a recent? That was one that was taken last year. Uh, I had a uh, Illinois specialty block, specialty crops block grant, uh, looking at uh, strategies for maximizing winter winter vegetable production in high tunnels. And so that was year two. And so those are plots within one of our high tunnels at Dixon Springs. And we were looking at uh, spinach, kale, carrots, and lettuce. And um, you see some row cover uh, kind of stacked up there. And so, you know, there were treatments looking at growing those crops on black plastic um, or on bare ground and then with and without row cover, as well as some planting dates. And so you see there, there's, I'm not sure what time of the year that we, that this picture was taken, um, looking at the fact that all of the rows have uh, plots in them. So it would have been after the 1st of November of last year. So at some point. Uh, and, yeah, so, and go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say that's, um, you know, an example of one of the projects that we've been able to do at the, at, with the high tunnels that we have at Dixon Springs. That's really cool. And, and so listeners, if you're listening, um, the there's a link below to our video that we do for this because we have the audio only, then we got the YouTube video that we also post. So uh, click on the YouTube link and you can see exactly what we're talking about. Now, Bronwyn, I said you were near Simpson, Illinois. Was that correct? Is that where you're located? Yes, the, the, the mailing address for Dixon Springs Ag Center is Simpson, Illinois, which is the closest post office. Um, Simpson is in Johnson County, but the Dixon Springs Ag Center is actually located in, located in Pope County. Hmm. Uh, and so um, for, for folks that may or may not know about the Dixon Springs Ag Center, it was um, the university, it is the southernmost uh, outdoor research facility um, for uh, ag agricultural production for the University of Illinois. And so uh, the university owns approximately 500 acres uh, here in, in Pope County. And then we lease another 4,400 acres from the uh, Forest Service. And they have a, we have a special use permit. And so there is approximately 500 acres here that uh, the University of Illinois can conduct uh, applied agriculture research on. Uh, the the Dix Springs Ag Center was established in about 1938. I think some of the very first uh, research plots were actually set out in 1935. Uh, but the official open house ribbon cutting ceremony is documented to be in October of 1938. Uh, and so there's been ongoing uh, applied agricultural research since, since that time. Currently, we have uh, research here at the station uh, being conducted by the animal science department. So there's a rather large uh, beef cow her, uh, herd here. Um, I think there, I see lots of calves hitting the ground, so to speak, in the pastures around us. So ouch, I'm literally hitting the ground sometimes. Um, and so I think uh, once calving is completed, completed, there can be between 15 and 1800 head of cattle on the station at one time. Um, we also have... Uh, a pretty, pretty productive forestry uh, research program going on uh, with uh, Chris Evans. He's a, our extension forester house at Dixon Springs. So he's got a lot of work with agroforestry projects and, uh, and other forest management um, projects here at the station. And then uh, the other big research area would be our local foods area. Um, that is where we have our three commercial size high tunnels. Um, and then we also have what we call our youth tunnel. Um, it's a little bit smaller tunnel that we do a lot of interdisciplinary work with our 4-H uh, youth in the, in the uh, unit on food access and insecurity. So uh, that's kind of, kind of uh, an overview of the station. And, and so, yes, um, that's a long-winded answer to Simpson, Illinois is in far Southern Illinois. Uh, uh, you said that uh, uh, when you introduce me, I am a local foods and small farms educator, and I work out of uh, Unit 24, and I have six counties that I cover. And again, these are all in far southeast Illinois. That would include um, Pope, Hardin, Saline, Gallatin, Hamilton, and White counties. And um, 
Fortunately, my office is located in Pope County at the Dixon Springs Ag Center, uh, and I also live in Pope County. So I'm, uh, I'm really glad to not have uh, a long work commute um, within those six counties. So uh, when I first started, I, my office was located in Carmi, so it was about an hour and uh, hour and 15, an hour and a half from my house. Um, and so now I'm, the office has been moved here to the Ag Center, and it's about a 15-minute commute. So I very much appreciate uh, being closer to home and being able to, to head into work. So That sounds perfect. I, I yeah. went to Carbondale, and I thought I was in Southern Illinois. And then we, I think it was Ken and I, we came to visit Dixon Springs Ag Center a few years ago. You got to drive like another hour yeah. or so beyond Carbondale to get to where you are all located. So that is... Yes. I mean, that's Southern Illinois and it's beautiful there. Yes. I, I actually grew up uh, three miles from the Ag Center here. Uh, my first job as a 16 year old was, um, you know, I was extra help um, in the summer in, in the horticulture research. So uh, this has kind of really been my home for probably more years than I want to actually admit on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask what brought you there, but uh, <laughs> I, was, I, uh, I never left, Chris. I've yes, just never. Left. You've always been there. That's right. And That's someday right. we can become fertilizer. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, yeah, we have. All right. Uh, our secretary is actually uh, retiring, and, and today is her, her last day. And uh, I think I'm now officially the <laughs> oldest and the longest employed person. <laughs> here at the station. So, um, that's, uh, makes you feel a little old some days. <laughs> <laughs> so Brownwin, can you tell us a little bit about some of the research that you're doing at the Dixon Springs Ag Center? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some of the research that we have going on, like I mentioned, we have, um, three commercial size high tunnels. And so when I say commercial size, those are 30 by 90, 96, um, tunnels. And those were actually put up. Um, the first one was put up in 2010. And then the second one, I think, um, probably went up in 2011 or 2012. And then the last one in 2014. Um, and so there are all three um, different are, are from three different manufacturers. And so the, the tunnels sitting here act as a demonstration just sitting there uh, um, for, for folks to come and look at. And um, we, I do get a lot of questions from people that are um, looking at, at purchasing a high tunnel or maybe they, their NRCS EQIP uh, application has been accepted now and they want to make sure that they're um, getting the... the uh, looking at all of the different aspects within high tunnels and trying to make uh, their purchase be as versatile as possible for their needs. And so it's really great to have those tunnels there for, for folks to come and look at and say, okay, this one has trussing, this one doesn't, this one is in hydroponic production, this one isn't. Um, and so I, we have quite a bit of demonstration going on within those tunnels for folks to look at. As far as, uh, Research projects, I mentioned earlier, um, the Winter Greens project uh, that we had going on, and that was in just in one of the three tunnels, um, and that was a, over the course of two winter seasons. Um, typically in the summer, we will have, uh, we always have uh, tomato variety trial. A lot of times we'll put in bell pepper variety trial. Sometimes they're replicated, sometimes they're observational. Um, this last summer, uh, one of our most recent projects, uh, working with Dr. Casey Athey, who is the new uh, specialty crops entomologist for University of Illinois, and we received a an Illinois or an extension collaboration grant to look at uh, biological control of insect pests in the high tunnels. And so we did a lot of uh, uh, insect monitoring, and then Dr. Athey released some natural predators looking at um, the insect populations within the tunnels and targeting um, kind of the three major pests that we see um, in high tunnels, which would, would be aphids, thrips, and uh, 
spider mites. And so we're looking at some of those natural enemies, natural predator enemies to kind of combat those uh, pretty limited on, on uh, pesticides that can be applied within a high tunnel. And so the more biological control that we can get, uh, we want to look at, look at how those systems work. So that was, that was um, pretty, it was a pretty interesting project actually this last summer. And we'll repeat that again next summer. Uh, and then also looking at um, uh, tomato fertility work. We also were looking at this, this past summer. So that's um, lots of different, different things within the hydroponic tunnel. Uh, we look at uh, cucumber variety trial and, and hydroponic cucumber production. We also have strawberries and vertical stack systems. Um, I stuck an elderberry in a, in a beto bucket and grew elderberry hydroponically. And um, I couldn't believe how long it was flowering and producing fruit, it just kept growing. So um, it's interesting. It takes up a lot of space an elderberry does in a tunnel. <laughs> Is there somewhere where a person can go to see the results of uh, the research that you're doing in the high tunnels? Last year when we were um, during our COVID situation and we were kind of locked down, I did a series of, of vlogs. Um, it's called Local Food Happenings at uh, Dixon Springs Ag Center. And those are shared on our Local Foods YouTube page. And so if you wanted to check those out, I think there are 18 or 19 uh, videos that, that I did. And I kind of set that up to make like a weekly diary and kind of give a progression of some of the projects that we had going on. Um, and then there were, there were times that I would target maybe a more specific topic in one of those vlogs. And so if you're interested, um, you know, I would definitely encourage folks to, to go to the YouTube channel and search through the, uh, find the playlist for the local food, local food happenings at DSAC, and maybe search those titles. If you find one that is of particular interest, you know, definitely hit on it. And, and if you've got questions, um, please feel free to contact me on that. So we've been talking a lot about high tunnels. Can you describe what a high tunnel is? Is that kind of the same thing as a greenhouse or is it something different? So high tunnels, the way the structure looks, yes, would look a lot like a greenhouse. The main difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is that high tunnels don't have an external heat source. We're just relying on the, the passive um, radiant heat coming from the sun. And so um, unlike a greenhouse, when we supply supplemental heat and, and potentially even supplemental lighting through uh, late fall and, and winter, you know, you can typically grow year round in a greenhouse because of that supplemental heat. Within, with a high tunnel, because we don't have that, you know, we can't, we might not necessarily be able to grow, well, we wouldn't be able to grow tomatoes or peppers, let's say year round in a high tunnel, but we can grow other crops. Um, and so we can actually utilize a high tunnel for year round food production. We just need to, we'll just transition into different crops. In the different seasons. All right. So you mentioned tomatoes there. <clears throat> That's one of the things you've been working on um, is tomatoes and high tunnels. Um, is there a certain type of tomato that you would grow in a high tunnel or you just kind of grow whatever you want? So a little bit more about my background before I started working for extension, which was in, I think I started with extension in January of 2014. So I've been with extension about eight years or so. Prior to that, I worked here at Dixon Springs as a research specialist in uh, applied uh, horticulture food crops. And so did a lot of research on fruits and vegetables, uh, out, you know, field trials with variety trials and things with tomatoes, peppers, um, all different types of crops. And so I have a, a, a strong background in research, uh, which is, so I'm, actually feel very fortunate that I have this station within my uh, unit, extension unit that I serve, um, so I can continue to do uh, the research that I really enjoy, as well as, you know, provide programming and, and benefits to our, our uh, fruit and vegetable growers within this, within the region of the state. And so, um, when I started looking at, when we start doing research within a high tunnel, 
um, I tend to look at a lot of varieties that I would have grown out in the field. How did those varieties translate and perform in a high tunnel? Because we are really, you know, creating a, almost a subtropical environment within these tunnels. And so we see um, a variety that we grow out in the field when we place it in a tunnel, it's, it's, it's a lot more vigorous, it, it yields a lot more. And so I tend to look at some of those uh, determinant field type varieties and how they perform within the high tunnel. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many other people have started receiving their, uh, I call them my Christmas catalogs. You start to get your, all your seed catalogs. I've got Johnny's and Seedway open here with all of my wish list and make start circling all the different varieties and um I, I would love to be able to plant like all of these varieties and look at all of them but we just physically don't have you know the manpower or the space to look at all of them um but you know you can grow determinate tomatoes indeterminates uh cherries romas heirlooms uh, they all perform really well within a high tunnel uh, and so you need to you know i think considering where you want to market, um, what your customer base might be, um, can kind of help you narrow narrow down um, the the varieties that you want to look at. Did that answer that question? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I find it to be somewhat I don't I don't want to sound mean, but kind of common when maybe a grower is new at this and they're putting tomatoes in a high tunnel. Um, they have to trellis. Mm -hmm. And I so often see trellises that just don't work in high tunnels. The tomatoes are flopping over. They try to do, what is the Florida weave? Sometimes that works well, but then they're growing an indeterminate in the high tunnel. And it's like, uh, where, where are they gonna go? Because you don't have as much space in a high tunnel as if a field uh, situation. So Ronwood, do you have any tips uh, for maybe a new time grower, especially if they choose indeterminate tomatoes in a high tunnel? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to choose an indeterminate, um, you know, and you're going to grow this in a, in a tunnel, you know, maybe in the field situation, you were used to putting indeterminates in a cage, or maybe you were, you were tying them individually to a really tall T-post. And so, you know, we don't have that space within a high tunnel, but um, I guess, you know, it's a good thing that this, I have this background picture, because if you notice I'm, I'm floating and my head is kind of even with this metal, you see the metal bar growing, going across, um, high tunnels that have a trellis or I'm sorry, a truss system within them, make it very easy for you to, you, to set up a trellising system for indeterminate, for, uh, tomatoes, um, with a, with a, truss system and in, in, in this tunnel we have W trussing. So it serves two purposes. It uh, adds stability um, to the structure so that if we see um, a heavy snow load or, or strong winds that the, the, the integrity of the high tunnel structure itself is um, increased over a, a tunnel that has no trussing or yeah, no trussing in it. Um, the other thing that we can utilize trussing for is we can uh, distribute the fruit load weight when we can trellis our indeterminates onto um, across those, those trusses. And so for us, we just um, take pieces of rebar, I don't know, half inch rebar, and we, uh, you know, those, those our spacing on our, um, our bows and our high tunnels are at six feet. And so we wanna have at least a, you know, maybe we go with a 10 foot or a 12 foot stick of rebar and lay it across the, the trusses. And then we can take our uh, twine, single twine, uh, tomato twine and hang it onto those trusses and then drop that down and use uh, clips and clip the uh, vine of the stem of the tomato onto those strings. And so we can use a, a single string trellis system for indeterminates. And we can prune those indeterminate tomatoes back to maybe one or two central leaders and keep training them up the, the uh, string and just use clips. And so you don't have to worry about um, the cages that you might've used out in the field when you were trying to, to train up these indeterminates. Um, 
Obviously, a trellis, uh, the floor to weave system is not going to work with indeterminates. They're going to be, you know, growing, the vines will grow crazy. Um, I think that we've had, um, you know, you're looking at tomato vines that can grow 20, 25 feet in a single season, um, depending on the length of your season and where you're located. And so that's pretty hard to manage. But using that single string um, trellis system works really well. And the some of the the vlog posts that I mentioned uh, on the local food happenings at DSAC, uh, I think we have one specifically on that type of trellising or training system. So I definitely encourage folks if you're interested to go take a look at that one. We can put a link below in our show notes to these these items that we're we're mentioning, and I, I'll just add, both Ken and Katie have had the talk with me about my use of indeterminates and poor trellising. So <laughs> I've already had that, that discussion with, uh, with both uh, Katie and Ken, so. Well, and I can tell you, even for us, when we put our determinants in, um, because those plants grow so much more vigorously within a tunnel than they do out in a field, uh, typically with a trellis weave, you can put, you know, you can have your wooden, your wooden tomato stakes, and they might be driven in the ground and, you know, maybe they're about four feet, four feet out of the ground. And, you know, you maybe you have a four or five foot T post at the end. We're, uh, you know, we're starting with T posts that are six foot T posts on the ends of our rows within this tunnel. Um, and our determinants, we get the string as high up on the wooden stake as we can, but then it still grows probably another two feet over and it ends up laying over on itself. So um, it, they're, they're pretty vigorous. So definitely a, a strong trellis system is, is very much needed for growing any type of tomato in a high tunnel system. For growing in a high tunnel system, are you um, doing different things like ground preparation, fertilizing than you would do outside? For growing outside? So it depends on within your high tunnel if you have made permanent raised beds or if you are just working the ground um, within that tunnel itself. If you look in the picture, um, my background picture again, you can see that we form permanent raised beds. Um, we, we squeeze them really tight together in this you know, 30 by 96, there's actually eight beds in there. Um, so we're able to get a lot more square footage of planting within this tunnel. It's, it's, it's pretty tight in there, um, but, but we can get more plants in there. If, if we were leaving this tunnel with bare ground and needing to work it with, um, you know, small, small equipment, uh, maybe a small two-wheel tractor, um, something like that, we probably wouldn't be able to get eight beds in there. And so within a, a system like ours, um, where we have these permanent beds, we can add and make amendments to the soil where we're adding um, different composts or different things. And so just like in a field setting, I uh, definitely want to encourage uh, soil testing to be done so that we know where our organic matter is at, our pH. Um, and also where our nutrient levels are at within the, the soil that we're looking at or utilizing in the, in the tunnel, whether it's, you know, brought in compost in these permanent raised beds, or if you're working the native soil um, within that tunnel itself. Um, as, as, as strong as and vigorous as these tomatoes tend to grow within the high tunnel system, um, I, we typically don't put a pre-plant pre fertilizer in prior to planting, uh, which would be different if you were setting them out in a field situation. You know, in a field situation, we're going to be putting down some pre-plant fertilizer before we ever come in with our transplants. Um, we don't, I, for us here at Dixon Springs in, in our situations, we do not do that. Um, you know, we're in the, we want to strike a balance. We want to, you um, have enough vegetation foliage cover on this tomato to support the fruit load. But, you know, we don't take tomato leaves to market. We take fruit to market. So we want to be uh, maximizing our fruit production um, and not growing so much plants. So we, we tend to back off 
of the nitrogen a little bit um, compared to a field situation. Uh, typically tomatoes, whether it's in the field or in a high tunnel have about, they, uh, they need about three times as much potassium as they do nitrogen, uh, approximately. Um, so they're, they're very much a, a potassium feeder, so to speak. And so um, when we look at our fertilizer that we're going to be applying, uh, we want to make sure that we're putting on more potassium than nitrogen because that's going to be our limiting factor. Um, and so, you know, we're, we still look at potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, um, just like we would in field production. Um, because we have our hydroponic tunnel as well, a lot of times I'll use some of that same hydroponic solution or fertilizer blend, which is a lower nitrogen, higher potassium blend uh, within these other systems as well. Uh, and everything that we grow in our high tunnels in the in the uh, in ground tunnels for the tomatoes, uh, we utilize drip irrigation. So I can also fertilize, that's where our fertilizer is, is being applied or how the fertilizer is being applied to the, the tomatoes is through the drip irrigation. Um, and that can be, we can apply fertilizer, typically we apply it weekly, um, but we could um, even split that and, and make three or four fertilizer applications through the course of the week because as these plants grow, um, you know, we're, we may be watering um, through the through the season. We'll definitely be watering once a day. Sometimes it might be twice a day. We we don't run the water for long periods of time, but just enough to keep the maintain a good soil moisture. Do you see blossom end rot quite as much in the high tunnel tomatoes? We typically do not see as much blossom end rot in the high tunnels um, because we are. Um, the management style within a high tunnel is a lot more intensive than in a field situation. We are really monitoring the moisture in the soil in those beds. And so we're able to maintain a much more even soil moisture uh, level within the tunnels than we would see in a field situation because we don't have the potential for a three inch rain underneath the cover of that high tunnel. Um, you know, the soil isn't gonna go from being completely saturated to drying out like we would see in a field situation. So because we have a more balanced um, uh, watering system and our soil moisture is, is a lot more balanced, we see a lot less blossom and rot issues. But I, there's always the caveat, there's always the but, it depends on your variety too. Some varieties are just going to be more susceptible to blossom and rot than others. Do you have to be careful with some of your fertilizers? You know, if you have calcium or something in, within those liquid feeds, will that, I, I've heard tale of growers having calcium levels that are just like through the high tunnel plastic, so to speak. Um, they just, they just put on a lot of calcium. Can you balance that out at all? That, yeah, I mean, that's tough. You have to um, really watch that. It's interesting. I, pulled soil samples this last fall, um, or the, I don't know, the end of, the end of August uh, in our tunnels, and my calcium levels tend to stay pretty high. Um, and I don't know, my, my pH is, pre, is pretty high too. Um, you know, ideally tomatoes prefer, you know, five, five to six, and I'm running about seven to seven and a half. And so sometimes I think that the my nutrients aren't always readily available because of that pH, um, the level that the pH is at. And so um, I don't know that we, you have to, you, yes, you do need to watch feeding too much calcium um, in there because you can't get too high of too high levels. Um, but I think, you know, we, we typically um, will run uh, alternating weeks um, where we have, you know, we'll put in potassium nitrate uh, or potassium sulfate, and then we will come back with some calcium nitrate. Um, but it's not, like I said, it's not weekly. It may be every other week or so. All right. So typically when we think of tomatoes, we're thinking summertime, 
in southern Illinois, it can get kind of hot. And I would imagine it gets rather hot in a high tunnel too in the summer. Um, and at some point, tomatoes will just stop producing um, when it gets too hot. Uh, is there anything you have to do to, to kind of cool off the high tunnels in order to get tomato production in the summer? So one of the other things that, that high tunnels have that when you asked me earlier what the difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is, um, high tunnels typically have sides that can be uh, lowered so that we have airflow coming into the tunnel, the full length of the tunnel across the side so we can get a cross breeze growing through. Um, a couple of our tunnels, we also have the ability to, on the end walls to really open those up. Um, one of them, we have the, the plastic taken completely off of it um, on, the, on the end walls. Um, and, because, and the reason that we do that is because that tunnel does not have, uh, we don't have fans, circulating fans, uh, horizontal airflow, HAF fans going in that tunnel. And so we need as much uh, airflow as possible within that tunnel to help keep humidity levels and temperatures down. Um, the tunnel that you see uh, in my backdrop, you can see the fans there. That tunnel um, has, has the circulating fans, which run all the time to help mix the, the air the, because the hot air is gonna rise to the top. And so we can, we can keep that mix and it helps keep our humidity levels lower. And then also within this tunnel that you see, those sides can drop down. And so those are kind of the two main things within a high tunnel um, to help keep the temperatures cool um, would be having um, proper ventilation. Um, if you have ridge, ridge vents or ridge caps that can open up um, or vented louvers on the, on the top of your end walls can also help as well. But circulating fans, opening your side curtains, um, possibly your in walls. Um, those are the main things. The other thing that we can do is add shade cloth over the top of the high tunnel. Um, the, so our hydroponic tunnel, we put shade cloth on it, which is a, it's a 50% shade. And that in that tunnel um, at 2 p.m. on a hot sunny day in June, it can be 103, 105, probably a little bit more, but when we put that shade cloth on, it drops it to about 93. So the shade cloth was able to drop that tunnel, that particular tunnel by about 10 degrees. Um, and so, you know, th there is definitely a benefit to being able to use shade cloth as well. Uh, and then one of the other things that I look at when I'm selecting my varieties that I wanna look at within the tunnel, because I do know how hot it can get in here is, looking at um, especially these determinant tomatoes that uh, are, are a uh, bred for more southern climates that are a hot set type tomato. Uh, one that comes to mind, um, Florida 91 has been a variety around for a really long time and it is, it is known as a hot set type. And so it, it's that variety is bred for you know, being able to produce in a, in a warmer climate. And so that's one of the things that I, a couple of things I look at uh, as ways to address um, the level of, of heat within those tunnels in the summer here in Southern Illinois, because yes, it, it does get toasty. <laughs> I'll just say when Ken and I, we were there, what, it was like June 18th, something like that. It was warm. <laughs> you step outside of the high tunnel, you feel like you walk into air conditioning. I think yes. it was like 98 like 100 degrees that day. So outside, <laughs> it was warm. So uh, Bron went to switch gears up here because I re remember uh, you telling us about this program a few years ago. I thought it was so neat. So um, you put together a program to go into a minimum security uh, uh, jail and to train inmates how to grow food. I, uh, the program is no longer happening now. That was because this was a couple of years ago, but could you tell us a little bit about the story of how this came about? Yeah, so um, I was contacted by uh, a warden at a, uh, actually it was at, the warden was actually at a medium security or, uh, facility. Um, Southern Illinois, you know, we have lots of forests and we also apparently have several prisons. And so <laughs> I don't know if there's a correlation between <laughs> I don't know, but that's what we have a lot of. And so 
like literally 10 minutes down the road from the station here, we have two correctional facilities. One is minimum and one is a medium security. So the warden uh, called me up and said, hey, I want to meet with you. Um, I'd like to see what extension, what kind of partnership could extension have with my facility. I'm really wanting to go look at some, some sustainability practices within the facility. Um, you know, he, he was himself an avid uh, beekeeper and, you know, had, had several hives, um, you know, located on the grounds of the facility. And so we met one day and he, he was asking me, you know, what, what types of things could we do? And I said, well, you know, let me, let me do some, some checking on this. And I said, but one thing I can tell you that I could offer you right now is I'm getting ready to have a beginning farmer training um, coming up in this, it was, you know, coming up in the next spring. And I said, I would invite, you know, yourself or any of your, uh, of the employees there that would be interested to come and take this beginning farmer training. And then maybe we could look at a little train the trainer situation where you could take this knowledge and go back and um, maybe apply it to some some garden areas within um, those facilities. And so that we started down that track, but in the meantime, I was having conversations with some of my fellow educators uh, here in the, in the region, um, a community and economic development educator um, that was with Extension at the time, um, and, and another one of our, uh, another a and educator that was in the region. And um, the more we talked, we were like, well, what could we do? And so we looked at, um, we were looking at some different funding opportunities. And so we, we submitted an application to the USDA uh, through um, their beginning farmer rancher program. And we actually were awarded a three-year beginning farmer rancher grant to look at um, bringing food production into the correctional facility. And um, I was able to take the master gardener curriculum as well as the beginning farmer curriculum that had already been established uh, that we that we utilized through extension um, as well as I believe I we also included uh, pesticide training and um, we we incorporated all of that curriculum in so in the course of a year the offenders that would enroll in our program would go through master gardener training beginner farmer training um, go through some pesticide applicator training and we actually uh, had the uh, Department of Ag uh, gentleman that does the testing here in our region would come into the facility and and do testing um, which gave them gave the the offenders that if they were going to be released within uh, the calendar year if they passed their test then they would have the opportunity to go ahead and get their license if they if their release date was not going to be within the calendar year, they at least had the experience of, you know, learning what that test looked like um, and kind of how to study for it. Um, and we actually had several several of the offenders that took took the test um, as they knew they were going to be released within that year and were able to go out, um, get licensed, and and start working. Um, and so I really felt like them being able to get that training and, and have that test under their belt help them, um, you know, to secure that job after their release time. Um, but again, this was a three-year program, uh, and it, we actually held it at the Vienna Correctional Center, which is a minimum security facility. Um, and within, within that facility, uh, I believe we plowed up about an acre and a half of their, of their yard and, wow. uh, each of the of the uh, participants in our program had a uh, a plot of of land that they worked on, and one of their assignments that they would get each year over Christmas break was to um, here is your here is your area. I want you to tell me um, design whatever type of garden that you would like. Whether you if you're not into food production but you really like flowers and you want to design you know, it's all, it's all in flowers. You can do that. Uh, if there's specific, specific vegetables that you like, or, you know, you want, you want to look at, you know, focus on that. Um, 
Another area of this program that we incorporated in uh, with the community and economic development educator was business planning as well. And so, you know, we wanted them to put a business plan together and ultimately, you know, draw it out on paper. This is what they did over Christmas break, draw it out on paper. What, you know, how many plants of what are you going to grow? How many seeds do you need? What's your anticipated yields? Um, so that you had an idea of what you could produce off of your section of land. And then in the springtime, we put that into play. And, you know, you actually have hands-on experience. They had a small, small little greenhouse facility on site. And so they were able to start their own transplants and grow them out in the greenhouse. Um, we put in some hydroponic uh, systems within that greenhouse. And so they had some ex hands-on experience with that type of system. Um, you know, and we wanted, we wanted to give them the ability to practice, you know, this potential uh, entrepreneurial opportunity that they might have um, once, once they were uh, released from, from the facility. And so I, I think we had, we had a few successes um, and which is, you know, if we were able to, you know, even change one person's life with this, I think that's important. And so um, sometimes it's, you know, we get hung up a lot on, on the numbers and, and how many hundreds of folks can we impact. But really, I think having a really strong impact, even on just one person, has a lot of weight to it. And so um, I, I enjoyed this, this uh, project that we worked on. Um, I, I laughed. I said, I, I think it, it um, made me a better educator because we would typically run a morning and an afternoon class and so I would have to present the lesson two times a day which you know gives you great practice for <laughs> mm -hmm. um, repeating things and so uh, anyway I it it made me feel good it made me feel like I was um, helping to um, you know make an impact on on some folks so that's awesome well Thank you for sharing that, Bron. I just, I, I love the story. And so I'm just, I, I wanted to get it on this podcast. So <laughs> yeah, and the, the, how you've touched them. I mean, you say just one, but I bet even that one person goes out in the world and there's other people that they interact with and it's, it, it snowballs from there. So, oh yeah. Yep. So Bronwyn, another big project that you work on is uh, coming up in January. Can you tell us about that event and then will you be there and what's what topics are you speaking about? Oh, you must be talking about the Illinois Specialty Crops Conference. <laughs> they didn't pay us to say this, though. No. <laughs> they did. <laughs> okay. um, so, yes, Illinois Specialty Crops Conference. I will definitely be there. Um, I am am uh, have been a longtime participant as far as being on the planning committee. And so... Um, I think I was chair of the uh, vegetable track. So um, looking at securing uh, presenters uh, for the vegetable track. Uh, that's one of my roles for the conference. And then um, I also will have a couple of presentations that I'll be delivering at the conference. But the Illinois Specialty Crops Conference will be held in person this year. I believe we actually are going to do a hybrid model. Um, so uh, I think the sessions will be recorded. But they are going to. We are going to be back at the Crown Plaza in Springfield on January fifth through the seventh for in-person um, conference. Um, so um, we're glad to be back in person. It'll be it'll be good to be able to see folks again. Um, on the uh, January fifth is typically the pre-conference um, workshops where we kind of drill down to some really specific topics uh, in those um, in. I think actually in the pre-conference workshop topics, I think that's where I'll be presenting in the new farmer track. Uh, I think I'm talking about strawberry production, um, a little bit more specifically plastic culture, strawberry production as a way that we grow um, strawberries here in Southern Illinois. And then also in the protected culture track, I'll be giving an update on the, uh, the research that I did on the winter vegetable production in the high tunnels. And so, like I said, the January 5th is the pre-conference workshops, and then the 6th and 7th would be the, the full conference events. And so I think anybody that's interested in attending, we definitely uh, encourage you to, to uh, 
register, I believe I saw the email, uh, the registration is now open. Um, and so registrations can start flowing in for that. And um, I think the, uh, we should be releasing uh, more specific programming information in the next couple of weeks. So. Hey, aren't you speaking at that too, Chris? Yeah, I, I'm talking ginger and other unique crops, whatever those other unique crops are. I don't know. I'm going to spend 95% of the time talking about ginger. So, <laughs> and Ken, you are going to get a sloopy on apple cider, aren't you? Them too, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one last, well, this isn't the only last project you're in, but one last project we'll talk about today anyway. Um, so is there any way people can learn more about what's going on at Dixon um, Springs, as well as other timely information around the state as it pertains to fruit and vegetable production? Well, just so happens we have this great newsletter, the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News Newsletter. And I believe that this is the 27th year for the newsletter. Um, we're in volume 27, so um, that tells me 27 years. But yes, Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News newsletter. Uh, myself and Nathan Johanning are the co-editors for that newsletter. And we the newsletter goes out once a month, typically about the third week of the month. Um, and we look for we we have updates from uh, different regions within the state, uh, as well as uh, you know fruit and vegetable production information, any upcoming news and announcements, uh, uh, sharing. Uh, there's a section for uh, upcoming programs that might be available, and so that is a. a a resource for, for fruit and vegetable growers uh, to, to definitely utilize. And if you would like to subscribe to that, you can send an email to either myself or Nathan. And I believe, I think um, in the show notes, I think maybe there'll be a, a link to the newsletter uh, website and then also uh, maybe throw, throw in our email addresses if, in case anybody wants to subscribe to that newsletter. And you should. It's an excellent newsletter. And I particularly enjoy the very end, the less seriously <laughs> part of the newsletter. So that, that makes that makes for a good, good read. How did you uh, did you like? Uh, do you like our World Series themed less seriously from mm -hmm. October? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I. I'm a huge fan of the puns. You every once in a while, you and Nathan get these like dad pun lists going, and it. I try to use as many as I can. Yeah. It's, uh... Well, that was a lot of great information about uh, growing in Southern Illinois in high tunnels, growing tomatoes in high tunnels. Um, you know, it just, and, and so much more. And so we have links that will be below in the description for all the things that we've mentioned uh, in the show notes. So uh, Bronwyn, local foods educator, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you guys. I, I was glad to do it and um, glad to be able to share some of the information and, and some of the research that we're doing here at Dixon Springs. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson, edited by Katie this week. Uh, Katie Parker. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Ken and Katie, for being here uh, as well. So uh, we're back at it after Thanksgiving break. Yeah, thank you, Brownwin, for joining us today. And Chris and Ken, I'm glad you decided to come back after Thanksgiving break. Yes, thank you, Brownwin. Learned a lot. We may have to have you or you and or Casey on talk about bugs in high tunnels. I think uh, having Casey on would be great. I have some aphids that need some predators. So <laughs> I would love to, uh, yes, bring this all together in my very own high tunnel. So, uh, well, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. <laughs>